This episode includes brief descriptions of abuse and violence. Please listen with discretion. It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Forgiveness seems like such a simple concept, but it can be one of the most difficult things we ever do. Maybe someone in your life has hurt you and you've never been able to forgive them. Maybe you've hurt someone else and they haven't forgiven you. Maybe it's time to see if that can change. Empo Tutu Van Furt joins us to talk about a book she co-wrote with her father Desmond Tutu. It's called The Book of Forgiving. It's an invitation and a step-by-step -step guide to walk what the Tutus call the fourfold path of forgiveness. Empo recently visited Brigham Young University to speak at the Maxwell Institute's symposium, Forgiveness and Reconciliation. The Institute's own Dr. Deidre Green was the visionary of this truly remarkable gathering. If you missed it, you can watch several of the presentations on the Institute's YouTube channel. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. I'm here today with Empo Tutu Van Furt. She's a co-author of a book called The Book of Forgiving, The Fourfold Path for Healing Ourselves and Our World. Empo, thanks for visiting us here at the Maxwell Institute. Thank you. You wrote this book with your father, Desmond Tutu, and the book says that you've pursued graduate work on the subject of forgiving, and you also have very personal stories pertaining to forgiveness that you bring to your research. So you've done academic work on an extremely personal subject. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what that's like. Yeah, I think that we all bring the whole of ourselves to our academic work. Um, otherwise, it doesn't engage us. It doesn't hold us there. And the work of forgiveness is uh, work that is very personal for me. And, and in the book, I describe a harrowing experience for my family. But you know, we live in a world in which there is always much to forgive. And it, it has been helpful to me to have the opportunity to really think about forgiveness. It's a term that is so much used, very particularly in the Christian faith. Uh, we're always telling people to, you know, go off and forgive and... Um, 70 times 7. Yes, and, and, and on and on. But we never tell people how to. And so the, that's where the, the Book of Forgiving came from, was from really trying to think, well, what actually is the process? And I went backwards from the process into um, looking at forgiveness as an academic discipline and as a theological discipline. Why do we have to forgive? What, what are we doing when we forgive? What is it? <laughs> what is in it for us? Yes. But what is in it for the world? Because you know, ultimately, theology is a discipline that is always looking beyond ourselves and beyond our own narrow interests to looking at what does, how does uh, forgiveness and how does forgiveness and reconciliation create that just community, that community of shalom, that, that whole and healthy community for which we all yearn um, and for which some of us strive. Yeah, it was really, it really stood out to me when you made that point in the book as well, that we talk about the importance of forgiveness, but how often have people sat down and, and read a book about forgiveness or, or studied forgiveness, the process of it, why we do it, why it can be hard, some of the difficulties that people might encounter. It's such an important and fundamental part of human life that a lot of times we don't spend, I think, enough time thinking about it. And I think that speaks to the value of this book. It's striking to me that at the outset of this book about forgiveness, you have to start by making a case that people should be forgiving. Talk about beginning the book that way. Well, I think that the challenge for some people is the sense that if I forgive, I am somehow letting the other person off the hook. I somehow either absolve them of responsibility for the harm that they've caused. I absolve them of the requirement to atone for what they've done or to, you know, that, that they don't have to pay for what they've done. I absolve them of any consequence for their action. 
And so there's, there is something in us that feels like, yeah, that, that doesn't sound fair. There's something that seems either unfair or unjust about the action of forgiving and of granting forgiveness. Or people get stuck because they feel the person who I have to forgive is no longer alive, is no longer present for me to forgive them or the person who I have to forgive hasn't even asked for my forgiveness. So there are all kinds of ways of getting stuck. And what we come to recognize as we go through the process of forgiveness is that we, we think of it as something that we're handing to somebody else, but it's actually a gift that we give to ourselves. Um, that that for forgiveness is ultimately, I think it's Antje Kroch, Kroch um, South, a South African theologian who describes it as that um, process of releasing ourselves from resentment and bitterness and anger and from the burden of having been victims and, and allows us to um, and here I depart from and and I'm, I'm adding on my own, um, and that it allows us to reclaim our ourselves, our power, and our identity. One of the things the book mentions as well is that forgiveness. There can be self interest in forgiveness. There can be a sort of sticking up for yourself or, or, or maintaining your own personal health by seeking forgiveness. You even talk about some of the scientifically proven benefits of being uh, forgiving? Well, we know it intuitively. Um, we know intuitively that um, walking around with a sense of resentment is a, a feeling of being closed down. There's a, you know, there's an intuitive sense that, that there is a way I'm closed down around this, around this person or around this issue. And if you're in a conflict with somebody in who's in your space or in your workspace or in your home space, you can feel in yourself that, you know, every time they come into the room, they irritate you or they say something and it mm. kind of, want, you know, it pushes you over the edge. And if you checked yourself, you would notice that your blood pressure is doing yeah. something and your heart rate is doing something else. And neither of those are particularly good things or desirable things that your, your blood pressure and your heart rate are doing. And that once you're able to forgive, then that person no longer exerts a kind of control on your over your physiology um, and that's very real um, it's you know sort of demonstrable and very real one of the things that you talk about is a a revenge cycle that, that mm -hmm. people can go into so when when someone is hurt or when someone uh, is wronged there are different paths they can go down this book recommends the path of forgiveness but there's also a path of revenge and you mentioned a personal thing that, that a very personal story that you brought to this book and it mm -hmm. regards angela yes. who was i believe a housekeeper yeah your, and, and very close to your family who was who was brutally killed yes uh, and and talk about that personal experience in relation to these paths of the revenge cycle or the or the forgiveness the path of forgiveness yeah so we well m my father um actually drew a sketch which is probably the extent of his art artwork um <laughs> two circles really good um and the revenge cycle is is a circle um that the you begin with an injury and you retaliate for the injury and then the person against whom you have retaliated in turn retaliates and so you keep going walking this circle of revenge retribution counter retribution um, and on and on and on ad infinitum or you have the forgiveness cycle um, which is where you are injured, you acknowledge that you have been hurt and you go through this fourfold path of telling the story, naming the hurt, offering forgiveness and either reconciling or releasing the relationship. But that means that you're then, you have a way out of this vicious circle 
um, of out of a vicious cycle and into something that is um, more open and liberating. You make a difference in the book by bringing up this personal story of Angela because you show that these basic cycles, the mm -hmm. circle or, or escaping that cycle, can be complicated because you at first weren't even sure exactly what happened to Angela. But no. because of that event, you you still carried this pain, you still carried this trauma. And how do you, you know, how do you reckon with that uh, in, in a case where you don't even know exactly who to direct that anger at? Yeah, um, Angela, well, let me describe briefly. Angela was our housekeeper. She lived with us in the house in our home in Cape Town. And she she was she was delightful very smart and very capable and very amazingly helpful with the the children she had a real knack for um particularly my youngest daughter who can be quite grumpy in the morning um angela seemed to manage to ungrumpify her and <laughs> you know and help us get on with the day and we i came home one afternoon and I'd been trying to reach Angela. I'd been phoning the house and um, no answer, no answer, which was really strange because usually she would pick up her phone and, you know, just let me know where she was and came home and found her in my daughter's bedroom and she had been murdered. And of course, um, for several weeks, we didn't know who it was who had um, who who had murdered her, but we eventually discovered that it was somebody who had been working in our in our home as a gardener, um, and he was he was later convicted of the murder, and I had the good fortune of being part of a faith community that, you know, allowed me and my children to, yeah, to rehearse the story um, just over and over again, were, were willing to hear us tell the story into the community and tell the story to each other. Um, as as a family to say what it was that had happened and and that process actually brought me to a place of um, yes I, I initially I was angry and afraid and angry for the loss of life and angry because it felt as though this person hadn't just stolen Angela's life and stolen this woman from her family and from us as well. Uh, but also it, it was as though they, they had literally stolen our home mm -hmm. um, because we couldn't go back there. We, it, it was just too traumatizing to go back there. And that was, that was excruciatingly painful as well. And then in telling the the story and retelling the story came to a place of feeling um, not anger but just an infinite sadness for for the person who could take a life in and who could take a life in that way and that you know I I can't think what there was that anyone could steal that was worth a life and but I, I think that I was really grateful um, for that community that that allowed us to walk towards forgiveness one of the main themes, it seems to me, of the book is the South African concept that you introduce in the introduction. Uh, am I pronouncing this correctly? Ubuntu? Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this literally means humanity. It seems like this concept 
is, is really the thrust of the entire book. Because you mentioned, mm -hmm. how could a person take someone else's life? How could this happen? And mm -hmm. sometimes we look at terrible acts that people commit and we're tempted to say, that person's a monster. That mm -hmm. person's, you know, they're a monster. Right. In this book, you, you challenge that thinking with this concept of Ubuntu. Well, yes. I mean, a, a, a monster has no responsibility for their action. And so once, once you account someone a monster, then you've written them off. Um, you've written off their responsibility for what they have done. You've written off the possibility that they can recover their full humanity. You've written off the reality of whatever it was that they have experienced that brought them to this place. You've written off the possibility of reconciliation that they, you know, that I think particularly for people of faith, it's a, an obscenity to call a person a monster because that is it is to say that they are beyond redemption, um, that, that here is someone who is out of God's reach. And particularly for Christians who speak about God's redeeming love and for those of us who believe in a God who takes us seriously and loves us passionately and reaches out for us infinitely. How dare we? How dare we ever say that someone is a monster? I think this might be maybe the most challenging part of the book. Do you, do you find people have difficulty with that? It's it is so much easier to write someone off. If I can't imagine what I would do, really, if, if something happened to one of my children, for example, and then how, if someone hurt them, uh, how I would be able to see the image of God in that person. That seems like, it seems very difficult. Oh, it's almost impossible. It's, it's almost impossible if we rely on our own resources if we depend on ourselves to be able to see the humanity in another. That, but that's actually not the requirement. Um, it's never the requirement. The, the, it, as people of faith, we are, and as Christians, we are called to be members of a community. And it is that community that upholds us. It is that community that challenges us. It is that community that moves us forward when we would rather stand still. And I don't think, I'm not sure that I think that forgiving that, yeah, what, what feels like the huge and unforgivable is the is the most difficult. I think what's, what is the most challenging for most people is forgiving what feels like a betrayal. You know, when, mm. when I feel that we have an agreement, um, when you act counter to our agreement and, you know, whatever that agreement is, when you are counter to our perceived agreement, that's when when it feels really hard to forgive. Interesting. It's like we're more vulnerable the closer we are to someone. Exactly. Hmm. Hmm. Exactly. One of the things you talk about uh, before you get into the actual fourfold path yes. of forgiveness is you debunk some myths. You talk about some things that forgiveness isn't. Yes. Um, some misperceptions about forgiveness that might be common. So forgiveness is something that's so important to human flourishing. There are a lot of unhealthy ideas about how forgiveness should work. 
what are some examples of those that come to mind? You've mentioned a few already, but yeah. what are some, some things that people well, might yes, get wrong that, about? Right, it? so that forgiveness is subversive of justice yeah. and that, that, that actually there's a parallel process. I had a nice conversation with my dad about, um, about God's forgiveness and my father saying, well, you know, that God's forgiveness doesn't mean that we don't have to live with the consequences of our actions. God, God forgives us in eternity. We are forgiven, um, but we still have to live with the consequences of what we have done. Um, so we don't go unforgiven into the grave, but we do have to face up with the temporal consequences of our actions. So if I've been a lifelong alcoholic, cirrhosis of the liver is going to be one of the consequences that I have to live with. Doesn't mean that I don't get forgiven for being an alcoholic. It does mean that I do have to live with the cirrhosis. But, you know, I think that even in in our, you know, simple household ways that Forgiveness is a is actually a practice that that we engage in order for our households to remain whole. Um, it's a process that we engage on a on an everyday basis, but we sometimes short circuit the process. Uh, we short circuit it with our children. Um, no, Johnny, give um, Peter the ball back. Um, Johnny, say sorry to Peter. I'm sorry. Okay, now <laughs> Arms Peter, folded. say you're sorry. forgiven. <laughs> yes, I forgive you. <laughs> and that yeah, yes. that worked. <laughs> um, and it's and and Johnny and Peter walk away feeling like. There's, there's something missing here. There's something that didn't happen here. There's something that that feels unresolved or incomplete. Um, and they're right. Um, there is, and and that, you know, we we can't require forgiveness, and we can't set a timetable for forgiveness. There isn't actually a should attached to forgiveness. It is that being able to forgive is um, is good for you, <laughs> um, is good for your health and well-being. But it's it um, it is as I said. It's not letting the other person off the hook. It's not um, short-circuiting justice. It's not absolving the other of the consequences of what they have done, but it is, um, it is liberating. Yeah, and another myth would be that forgiveness requires one to continue to put themselves in harm's way. So for example, I know an example of, of a woman who had a spiritual advisor who told her, uh, your husband beats you, that's wrong, but if you stay in the relationship and forgive him, you might be able to help him change and everything but maybe he won't but you should still kind of stay in that situation and forgive what, what about a situation like that where you talk a little bit about this in the book about i did yeah that that forgiveness doesn't require that you endanger yourself that you can forgive and for your own safety and well-being get out of there and uh, you know, in the the end of the process, which you know, I mean, mm -hmm. we don't talk really deeply um, or or in you know, sort of at great length about reconciliation, but reconciliation is the partner to forgiveness, and reconciliation is is that thing of. God saying, "Behold, I make all things new; that I make a, um, I will make a new relationship on just terms, on terms of love and wholeness and justice." So, when when you have forgiven, it doesn't mean that you go back to what was before. Um, that that when you have forgiven, you have opened the door for a new and different and just relationship to occur. And that's, you know, where reconciliation requires the other person, um, requires the perpetrator to be part of the story. 
but reconciliation isn't the job of the victim. And it is, again, where we speak about being the body of Christ, not one of us alone, but all of us together are the body of Christ. And so that the the task of becoming reconciled can't rest only on the shoulders of the one who was previously victimized, but it must be that the community holds the perpetrator to account and says, okay, you know, this this person has now opened the door for a just, a more just dispensation, a more just um, way of being. What is your What is your role? How do you um, How How do you show up here? Um, and that's you know, and I think that that again, that's a, a place where we as faith communities have really fallen short um, because it's 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 really nice um, in a way. I mean, I saw recently a, a pastor who had been um, sec- had had been had had sexual relationships, extramarital relationships, and you know, sort of came to his congregation to apologize, and there was you know great tearful apology, and he the congregation forgave him. But didn't hold him to account um, that, okay, we as a congregation are willing to forgive you, but there is a right making that you have to do with the other people or with the people with whom you have been involved with your spouse, with the other woman or other women, um, that that you have work to do there and you, you haven't finished. Um, this is just where you start. That's the Reverend M. Po Tutu Van Furt, and we're talking about the Book of Forgiving, the fourfold path for healing ourselves and our world. Let's talk about that fourfold path. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll talk about each step real, uh, quickly here, although this pr- we talk about it quickly here, but this is a process that could happen in a matter of hours, in a matter of weeks, in a matter of years. Mm-hmm. It can take a lifetime. Uh, yes. It really depends. You, you, in the book, give no exact timeline. There's no sense in which people need to follow this path on a set schedule. No, and we set the path out and and offer tools, a, a sort of a kit bag, um, a forgiveness kit bag, but you can only go as fast as you can go. Um, you can't you you can't push yourself through a process of forgiveness because then it's not a real process. Yeah, I um, like the the cover of the book is beautiful. It shows this image of a, of a flower growing. And I, I think that viewing forgiveness organically that way yeah. is useful in, in the sense that you're a gardener that's cultivating a garden where forgiveness can happen, but you can't make the seeds sprout yourself. There's a process yeah. that you can take to help facilitate that, but you can't you can't make them grow. You can't say, I want this tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you can. Yeah, you, you could can say that. You can want it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Whether you, or not you get yeah, it tomorrow okay. is another yeah, Say story. it all you want. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so step one, speaking of, of saying, is, is step one is to tell the story. Why is that the beginning? Why, why begin with telling the story? Because it is important to lay down what is it that happened? What happened that is, you know, that that has brought us to a place where we need forgiveness to happen? So tell the story, tell the story as clearly as you can, tell the story as often as you need to, write it down, find someone to tell, whatever it is that you, you feel is necessary for you to feel that you have finished telling the story, that you've told a story that is as complete as you can tell. And sometimes that is the most difficult part of the process for some people just to be able to say, this is what happened to me. Because sometimes there is so much shame um, attached to the injury that has been committed. I was reading in the... uh, in the submissions to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as part of, of, of some research that I was doing, women who had been sexually abused as political prisoners and, and some of the women were now 
parliamentarians in the in the new South Africa. The, and in fact, at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, sexual victimization was really underreported mm -hmm. because often what would be told was, I know that it happened to somebody else or I heard that, or, you know, and, and reported in that way. Because but there was stigma attached to that? You didn't want to be a person well, who experienced that? Yeah, you didn't want to be the person who experienced it. A, a sexual violation is always an incredibly traumatic kind of violence because, in and you know, for, for women, somebody invades your body. Um, and there's, you, and yeah, w where do you go with that? Yeah. And some of the women who were parliamentarians in the new South Africa said, I, I couldn't say that this had happened to me. How would my colleagues around me look at me if they knew that I had had this experience? And so just the 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 stigma and the shame attached to the injury you know and sexual violence is a is a very particular kind of violence because in all other kinds of um of injury um the shame accrues to the perpetrator and in sexual violence the shame accrues to to the victim or the survivor and so that's um, that that can be the steepest climb for someone to make is to be able to 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 tell the story to say yeah that this actually happened to me yeah so you say it begins there people need to tell the story and find a way to tell that story to different people in different circumstances as you said some people need to do it repeatedly and the idea there is to to be able to bring it out. Uh, it's almost like flushing a wound or sort of getting it out there and not to get stuck at that level. You talk about the next step, which is then naming the hurt. How is naming the hurt different from telling the story? Well, naming the hurt is to say what the impact of the event was on me. So um, I think I, I, I give the example a very facile daily example of you know your child knocks over your favorite vase and you you say you know i'm uh johnny i'm so irritated that you knocked over my vase it was my favorite vase from my great aunt gertrude um <laughs> or say your son breaks your new blu-ray player <clears throat> not saying it yeah, not, say it. <laughs> <laughs> not mentioning names yes. not speaking about <clears throat> anyone in particular yes yes <laughs> but you know that i told you not to do that you deliberately disobeyed me i i i felt um dishonored by by what you had done and also that I'm really annoyed that I have to fork out another whatever it is to pay for the new Blu-ray player or... Or a vase that's irreplaceable. Or exactly. Um, and that might be all it takes is, you know, I felt annoyed or I felt angry or um, dishonored or, or disobeyed or that you're, you're, you're challenging my authority in some way or whatever it is. But naming the, naming the hurt is to, is to put a word on the feeling and using feeling words that can help the person hearing you kind of get access to, oh, that's how, that's how what, what I did impacted you. Yeah, it requires a certain kind of emotional intelligence. And I noticed in some of the, the references that you refer to, Dan Siegel is yeah. one of the people whose work you cited, whose work mm -hmm. I've found to be very helpful as a parent in sort of learning how to, to how important it is to actually name and label certain emotions and yeah. feelings and help kids learn how to do that too. Naming the hurt yeah. is, is a supplement to telling the story. Yeah, yeah. What about um, when you're telling the story and naming the hurt, you also have some suggestions for people who are listening when people do that. What are, what are some suggestions to hear people who are telling the story or naming the hurt? So the idea as a, as a hearer or as a listener is, is um, to hold the space open. So you're not fixing, you're not solving, you're not offering a running commentary <laughs> that's my that's my problem by the way 
um, and um, yeah, and you're you're also I, I find one of the one of the things that um, that can drive me over the edge is um, is when someone else names you know gives a name to my feeling mm. it's like no you you don't know what i feel yeah. until i tell you what i'm feeling so you know don't tell me what i'm feeling let me tell you sometimes people want to do that because it's uncomfortable sometimes yes. to listen to this and yeah. let me rush you through that let me <laughs> oh i see this must be how you're feeling well maybe that's part of it but it's not their place to tell you that and also yeah. you yeah, like you said you need to be the one it's naming that. Yeah. But I think, I think it's natural to want to do that because it can be hard to listen. It can be hard to sit with and create space for people. Yeah. It's actually, it can be quite excruciating. Um, Especially if you're the one that did the hurt. Yes. <laughs> Especially if you're the one that did the hurt. But the gift of listening when you're the one who did the hurt is that it's much less likely that you will inflict the same hurt again because you have heard and taken in um, how it impacted the other person and that that it you know it does it open up your the, the empathetic space within you right so we have tell the story name the hurt the third step on the path is the granting forgiveness and what does that what what does that actually look like when you get to that point in the process it has some maybe some different appearances but it's usually a release that you know I I'm not going to hold on to this hurt any longer I no longer reserve the right to exact retribution for what you did that I'm no longer hooked into you and hooked into your behavior in that way yeah, there's a certain kind of control that that someone who's hurt you can exert over you when when you hold this. It's really hard to preach that message, though, right? Because it's almost like you're telling someone you're. It's almost like you blame the victim a little bit, right? Like, how do you avoid blaming the victim in that case of saying, "Listen, by holding on to this grudge or by not being able to grant forgiveness, you're hurting yourself." So get to this place where you can forgive. That's a sermon that I can better preach to myself than to other people, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I always frame forgiveness as an invitation. You know, there's an, there is an invitation that is there for you to forgive the other person. Instead and, of a should. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. A should is incredibly unhelpful. And it a should is a burden. An invitation is an opportunity. And you can always take up the opportunity whenever you're ready to do so. But you, you know that it's always there for you. One of the suggestions that, uh, that you make is that people really try to exercise some empathy at this stage in granting forgiveness and recognizing common humanity and recognizing your own fallibility. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on the same level as someone who's hurt you. But getting back to the Ubuntu concept, we're all human, that we're all connected to God, but we're all also fallible. And so there's there are some exercises that you recommend in, in sort of recognizing your own fallibility as a tool to help you be able to forgive. Yeah. Um, well, and, you know, sort of in, in most of our relationships, there isn't a, a clear cut, you're entirely in the wrong and I'm entirely in the right. It's usually, you know, there's, there's shades of you're wronger than I am, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes, indeed. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not entirely unblemished, um, and so it does. It does help to to be able to recognize and acknowledge that yeah, there's I I have a part here, and even when I don't have a part in this particular experience or injury. I can see that it's not impossible for me um, to have inflicted harm as well. So 
tell the story, name the hurt, grant forgiveness. And again, there's no timeline on this. This is something that can happen quickly. It can happen slowly. The final step is renewing or releasing the relationship. Describe that. So renewing the relationship would be, ex you know, exactly that frame of reconciliation. So, um, and, and quite deliberately renew, um, meaning going for a new and um, more just relationship. So even in the in the small interaction with the with the vase, um, that the new relationship is of yes, I am the child who kicked over the vase and now I know why it is that you didn't want me to play with the ball in the house. Um, and so I, there's a, a marker underneath that um, relationship that says, okay, um, I can, I, we can move into a new relationship of being a child who no longer plays with the ball inside the house. <laughs> um, and I can, you know, I can figure out other places to play. Um, and that, that is the, the kind of the, the reconciliatory move. And you have both grown through the encounter. What about with releasing? What is there about that that isn't sort of perpetuating negative feelings? Like finding a way to release that's not like, oh, I still have really bad feelings about this person or, you know. What does releasing look like in a healthy way? Releasing in a healthy way looks like I no longer wish you ill. In fact, I may even wish good things for you, but I also recognize that it's not healthy for me to be in the same environment as you. And that is release. I'm not. I'm not going looking for you. Um, I had a, a conversation with Justice Alby Sachs, who was um, one of the justices from our Constitutional Court, which is kind of the equivalent of the U.S. Supreme Court, but for South Africa. And he was injured by a a parcel bomb that was sent to him. He was in exile in Maputo in Mozambique and the South African government sent him a parcel bomb and he uh, ended up facing the man who had constructed and sent him this parcel bomb during the TRC hearings and he forgave him. And he said, you know, um, yes, I forgive him. No, I, I no longer carry any resentment um, towards him. And the, the bomb blast blew off his arm and, um, and blinded him in one eye. But he said, you know, I, I forgive him. I have no animus towards him. If I see him in the street, I can say hi. But he's not the person who I want to go and have you know, popcorn at the movies, that, that that's just, that's not going to be our story together. And so release is, you're no longer on my radar screen in that way. Speaking of that person who, uh, uh, Albie Sachs, who was hurt, mm -hmm. it reminded me again with the situation with Angela, where you had been going through the fourfold path, tell the story, name the hurt, granting forgiveness, renewing or releasing. You're, you're going through this process and you discovered that it's not necessarily once and for all. You've worked with other people. Uh, I remember, I, I believe, a couple whose child was killed by a drunk driver um, and, and now they speak about forgiveness. And But they find themselves, it, it's not that they went through the process and that that did it once and for all. Yeah. I remember having a, a conversation with Linda Beale. Linda um, Linda's daughter Amy was killed in a township in, in South Africa in 1993 and she was ki uh, Amy was an, uh, an American and a Fulbright scholar in Cape Town and was killed I think a couple of days before she was due to return home and um, the when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was impaneled 
the three young men who had been found guilty of, of Amy's murder had been found guilty, tried and were imprisoned. And when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was impaneled, they applied for amnesty. And Amy's parents flew to South Africa um, to support the amnesty application. Um, which, you know, I mean, that that was incredible in and of itself. But they then established a foundation in that township in, in Amy's honor um, to do, to continue the work that Amy had started. And they employed the young men in the foundation. And Linda said, you know, I... Um, for part of the year I, I'm in South Africa and on most days um, I'm seeing these young men who killed my daughter um, and on some days I have to forgive them all over again um, it, you know it's it, every day I wake up and my daughter is dead um, and some days I have to forgive them again and it's yeah but it's a the process is kind of analogous to even to a process that you have in, in your body if you you know if you break a limb or you have a cut um the the healing isn't you know sort of on a single straight trajectory it's a you know sometimes there's a, a twinge um is it healing yes it's healing but you know sometimes it's like oh yeah i i remember i i did that that's the Reverend Empo Tutu Van Furt. We're talking about the Book of Forgiving, the fourfold path for healing ourselves and our world. Empo, the book also has a chapter on what to do when you need forgiveness and seeking forgiveness from other people. Depending on the nature of the hurt, depending on who you hurt, it can take different shapes. But you give a general outline, which is similar to the fourfold path. It, it's kind of coming down the other side of the path. You, you're, you kind of tell the story. You admit the wrong. You state it openly. You listen. You don't justify. Then you have to the, – the part that I think that, – that I, before I had read this book, I think was circumventing was the need to witness the anguish uh, and hear the other person out. I, I've been quick to forgive but, but haven't always sat with another person's pain or let them name it. Uh, that's a difficult one. Then to directly ask for forgiveness, to make amends. You get this great process, and I, I encourage people to check the book out. But what do you say to someone who goes through those steps and the other person can't find it within themselves to forgive you? What about that? In a way, you're still hurting them then, too, because you know, you've caused that pain, and now they're going to be internalizing that. They're going to be dealing with negative effects of that. What about when people just can't forgive you? Well, when people just can't forgive you, um, yet. <laughs> um, yeah, you say yet, right? Yeah. I think that I think in the book you say that word yet is a powerful word. Yeah, when they can't forgive you yet, they can't forgive you yet. Um, that you you have to honor their process. You committed the injury, and you you have to sit with the process that they have to go through and endure, and you know, and and yet, and yet, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you also engage a process faithfully um, of hearing out, of making amends, of asking, okay, well, what is it that, that you need for us to be restored? And yeah, and maybe that need is for you to be out of their orbit for a while. But, you know, I think it's, it is important to engage that process faithfully as well. And you can't demand forgiveness. Um, that's you know that's that's not that's not yours to demand. How about in the case of a, of a group that hurts someone? So, for example, let's say a, a government or or a business or a church or something. How does seeking reconciliation and forgiveness work on a corporate level? Is it similar to how it works on a personal level? It is similar to how it works on a personal level, and 
I think, you know, again, we're very quick and very able to say, you know, I'm sorry. And even as a as as governments or corporate entities to say, okay, well, we're we're sorry, and now let's move on. Um, and the reality is that it's a way of not taking accountability. Um, not taking responsibility, not being accountable for, not taking responsibility for the harm that we have caused, A, and not um, enduring the, the pain of sitting with, of witnessing the other's pain, of, you know, of what, okay, I've said I'm sorry, and that's half the story. The other half of the story is I am willing to bear what you have to say to me about how you have experienced what what has been done to you. Before we go, I just have a few other quick questions, maybe a little self-indulgent, but what was it like writing a book with your father? Was the, was the process difficult at all? Because, you, you know, you, it's your it's your dad. So was that difficult at all? Or were there any frictions there? Did you ever did either of you ever have to seek forgiveness or anything <laughs> like during the process? <laughs> no, actually, I have a lot of fun writing with my dad. He is very thoughtful. And so when we came to our writing time, it was as a, we'd go to a series of conversations. So I'd outline and then we have a conversation about what, what we were talking about and what stories he wanted to share and tell and, you know, and we'd share insights. I really found that to be enjoyable. It was, I found, I, I had written a previous book with him, Made for Goodness, and the experience for me was, um, was almost like having a personal retreat with my dad, and I, I really enjoyed it. Were there any points of disagreement uh, as, as you worked through concepts about like any anything about the fourfold path or about anything? Do you remember anything that was because sometimes authors have to kind of negotiate when you're co-authoring something or was it just more organic than that? And you just sort of felt of one accord as it as it unrolled. Yeah, it was it was I, I felt it to be much more organic, plus uh, because, I, you know, I did most of the actual writing. So I just got to put words in his mouth. <laughs> that worked really well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and one more thing I wanted to mention too, and you hinted at this earlier, but the book includes it's not just it's not just giving descriptions and, and possibilities. It also each chapter includes rituals. It, yes. in, it includes writing prompts for journaling. It includes actual rituals using a stone and doing these different things. Talk about how those ended up being included. Well, I had done a course on forgiveness during Lent in one year, and I really found that people found tactile experiences and, and the opportunity to journal and to share to be really helpful um, for processing. And so um, I thought, well, you know, these are tools to, to put into the book and, you know, tools that, that that I have used and had had some feedback on that, that people said, yeah, this was this was really helpful and, and this really worked for me. And the stuff that people didn't, you know, didn't feel particularly engaging, didn't get included. I think, I think they're quite lovely. I recommend people uh, use this book, The Book of Forgiving. I, I think not only do you make the case for the importance of forgiveness, you describe how it sh how it can work it's and you do it as an invitation as you said and you you talk about the importance of that word yet when s someone says i could i can i can't forgive that person i can't and you would always say yet you know if you can put that yet on the end of that and then it has these different uh, meditations people can do and the rituals that they can go through it's quite a remarkable book and so i, I strongly recommend that people pick it up what are you working on now Oh, well, I'm um, now working on a few things, <laughs> because why not? <laughs> um, I'm, A, I'm painting, B, I, I'm in a new and blended family, which is um, very exciting. Um, with teenagers, um, so the book will come in handy. And the book that. is the book is really useful. <laughs> Do you feel uh, pressure because of that? Like you're supposed to be an expert on forgiving. Do you feel pressure about? Oh boy, like <laughs> I, I've got to get this right. No, I don't. I think we're you know I yeah I 
think I hope that the the book is is written in a way that we get to be gentle with ourselves. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and there's a chapter and on that, self forgiveness. Yeah, so, yeah, and that you know just uh, get, you know cut yourself a little bit of slack. Okay. So. So you're um, working with the blended family stuff. You're painting. I'm painting, and and my wife and I are also working on a book together. So okay. I'm looking forward. What's to the it. subject of it? It's our life together. So um, writing about that and and about our marriage and union and um, and the challenges of that. Yeah. Is that still early on in the process, or is that? It's let's say halfway if it was up to her we would be closer to the end but <laughs> great <laughs> since i get most of the editing tasks we're not quite so close to the <laughs> okay, end <laughs> yes okay well good well again empo thank you so much for being here it's, it's been a real uh it's been very personally enriching for me to read this book and, and to yeah. meet with you thank you so much for taking the time and god bless you Hey, before we go, I wanted to take a quick second to thank all the people so far who've taken the time to rate and review the show on iTunes. It's one of the most important ways you can help our audience grow. Here's a review submitted by a friend of the Institute, Patrick Mason, so you'll have to take it with a grain of salt. Patrick says, I generally don't listen to podcasts, but I make a point of listening to this one. Blair brings the best out of his guests, and every episode offers a slightly different lens on the dynamic relationship of the life of the mind and the life of the spirit. This podcast is a model for the intellectual curiosity and generosity that disciple scholars should seek to foster. And having Adam Miller read his one-star reviews was laugh out loud funny. Well, thank you, Patrick. This review gave me all of the good feelings. And if you would like to rate and review the show, you can do that in iTunes. You can also send questions and comments to me about this and other episodes to the email address mipodcast at byu.edu. And we'll see you next time.